Well, good morning. We are so glad you're here. For those of you that are joining us electronically, we are glad that you are joining us. I pray that uh, you're well this morning and uh, that you're able to join in in praise and worship with us here in the congregation. Uh, so we're glad that you're all here. Let's uh, seek the Lord while he may be found. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have a great opportunity this morning that uh, I am not willing to be less than appreciative of it. And so, Lord, and that's that we can still publicly affirm our love for you. We can still publicly say Jesus is Lord and King of my life, the only one who rose from the dead. And, Lord, I am so gracious or grateful for your graciousness to us that we can meet still and worship and praise together as sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, uh, in this place of worship, which we have dedicated, separated for you. God, may you have your way in our midst. May you touch lives. To those that are not feeling well, Lord, I pray, God, that uh, you would touch them where they're at, bring a healing touch to them. For those that may be uh, exhausted uh, from the events of last week, whatever the case may be, Lord, I pray that they would set that aside and worship you and praise you this morning or whenever it is that they're able to tune in. I know there are some that tune in right now with us live, and there are those that look later. Um, but Lord, I just pray that you would minister to them, encourage them, bless them. And Lord, we just thank you for all your, pra all your blessings. May your anointing abound in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we'd like to encourage you to join us standing. Uh, if you'd like, and if you can't stand, that's okay, as long as the uh, insides of the heart standing and rejoicing and worshiping God. Amen?
Jesus Redeemer lies it to say You are the love song we'll sing forever Bowing before you blessing your name think of Christmas, we think of gift giving, and when you're younger, you think of gift getting, <laughs> right? I mean, what little kid can't wait to see gifts under the Christmas tree, you know? I mean, that's just the way it is. And, you know, as parents, you know, for the most part, when you give gifts to your kids, the best part of the gift is the facial expression those kids make when they tear open to that gift and see they have a brand new pair of socks. <laughs> but you know, I can't help but think how every gift I've ever received, though graciously received and given with an immense love from those who give in gifts, pale in comparison 
to the gift that God's given to us, isn't it? And you know, sometimes we spend a lot of time uh, putting uh, effort and emphasis in shopping uh, for the perfect gift for that loved one that we have. And you know, as wonderful as that is, as thoughtful as that is, as exciting as that is, it still doesn't compare to the greatest gift that has been given. As a matter of fact, as a Christian, you know what the greatest gift that I could ever get at Christmas? I mean, bar none. The best gift is that my children give their life to Jesus Christ. Amen. That my grandchildren give their life to Jesus Christ. There's no gift better than that. I would be more happy over that than anything this planet has. That would be the best. How many of you have family members that, man, that would rock your world? Come on, if they just said, hey, I just want to receive Jesus as a gift, that would rock your world, amen? amen. Then let's pray for that right now. God, as the hands are up all over the place, we have family members, Lord Jesus, that have gotten gifts from us, and they're great and they're wonderful, but nothing compared to the wonderful gift you've given to us. And God, for those that have not been awakened to the fact that the greatest gift on the planet is what we're going to be celebrating just in a week and a half, Lord, God, that I pray that they would receive openly the gift that you have prepared for them. Lord God, they don't even have to unwrap this gift. They just got to accept this gift. Hallelujah. Because, Lord, as we know, a gift given isn't truly received until the person who has their name on that thing takes the gift, opens it, and takes it upon themselves. And so, God, you gave the greatest gift, and his name is Jesus. And, Lord, there are many, 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 Lord, that have not partaken, have not taken this gift for themselves. Lord, how awful that would be if we as parents or friends or siblings or loved ones gave a gift and left it at the tree, and the person whose name was on it didn't even care, didn't even look at it, didn't even touch it. How that would break our hearts. But Lord God, you gave the best gift. You gave Jesus. And I pray, Father, for these loved ones that may not have received the greatest gift, that they this year would receive the gift. And those of you by electronics, if you have somebody in your life that accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior for this Christmas season, please write us, email us, go on our website, let us know. We are going to rejoice with you over the reception of the greatest gift ever provided, ever. Hallelujah. Amen. So this morning, last week we covered 400 years in a short period of time. This year we're not going to be covering that much uh, ground uh, today. But, uh, but what I want to talk about is something that's on a lot of Christians' mind today, and that's prophecy. And as it should be, to some degree, but I know that there's a lot of prophecy right now going about what happens January 20th, 2021. But you know, that pales in comparison to the prophecy that we're going to talk about today. It really does. As a matter of fact, I would dare say that some of us, maybe by electronic or whatever, are more concerned about the prophecy that happens on the 20th of January, 2021, than the prophecy that establishes the truth that Jesus is the prophet, the one that was prophesied about in the Old Testament. He is the true Messiah, far none. And i got to tell you, for us, as the foundation of our faith, Jesus, we should be more concerned that the prophecies that were spoken about him are accurate to the T without any misguidance at all. They have to be accurate. Otherwise, we can't believe in him. Amen? That should be something that's so strong in our lives, so prevalent in our lives, we focus on that. Both his first coming and his second coming. That should be the greatest thing that we study. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Because you know, for our Jewish friends out there, by the way, happy Hanukkah. We are right in the middle of, well, sort of in the middle, the first part of the first half of Hanukkah. It's eight days long, started on Thursday. And uh, for those of you that don't know the history, talk to me later. We'll get it on, uh, we'll get a conversation on. But this is an exciting time of year for our Jewish brothers and sisters, our Jewish uh, family, friends. Uh, they're celebrating a miraculous time that took place in those 400 silent years. They're celebrating that today. But let's talk about prophecy because, you know, in order for us, honestly, to make a declaration to those that are familiar with the Old Testament, such as my Jewish friends, um, 
for them to buy into, if I could use that word, but it's a terrible word, but we all understand what that means. If they can buy into the fact that Jesus truly is the Messiah, they have to be convinced from the Old Testament. They have to be convinced. As a matter of fact, if they're not convinced by Old Testament writings that Jesus is who they say he is, they will never come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. And so today we're going to start with, we're going to talk about four prophetic things that Jesus fulfilled and the uniqueness of those four prophetic things. All right? So we're going to start in Micah chapter 5, verse 2 says, But as for you, Bethlehem, Epaphtha, I think, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. A little background on Micah. He was a southern prophet. No, I'm kidding. He was a southern prophet in Judah. He probably didn't have a slang. And contemporary of Isaiah. Historians believe the book was written approximately 800 years before the time of Jesus' birth. Now, let's just go back to where we were. But as for you, Bethlehem, at Pathworth, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me, meaning God, to be ruler of Israel. His going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. 800 years before it came to pass. He's talking about some prophetic about Jesus. So Micah 5, 2 reveals three prophecies about Jesus. The first is the place of birth, which is Bethlehem. Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem. Now, for those of you that don't know, did you know that that was an interesting feat? Because in the time that Jesus was born, his mom and dad were living in Nazareth. They were. And so here's something that I think is absolutely awesome, amazing, and phenomenal. And I want to just touch on this a little bit. A non-believing king about any of the prophecies commanded that all Israel be having a census taken. And they had to go to the place of their homeland, their place of where their families uh, resided. And so guess what Joseph and Mary had to do? They had to take a ride from Nazareth to go to Bethlehem. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the, time, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. We talked about this last week a little bit. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet, which is Micah. So Micah prophesies about a place where Jesus is to be born. Now, let me tell you the dynamic thing about Scripture. Did you know that whether we are ignorant of Scripture or we're not ignorant of Scripture, Scripture still takes place? Right? Now think about the power of Scripture. I can almost dance right now with no music. Think about the power of Scripture. Think about this for just a moment. I believe every word in this book. I may not understand times and epics and all these things. I may not understand some of the translation from Greek to Hebrew and, and all that, but I, I rely on the accuracy of this book. Here's the thing that's interesting. Now, if I were shaky or if this were not the type of book that it is, what I would do is if I, you know, took this book and loved this book and I thought it was great and I thought the things were in it uh, were accurate or I'd like them to be accurate, but I didn't trust in them, I would do anything and everything in my power to make sure that this stuff that was written in here would happen. As an example, Jesus said in the last days, it'll be like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. It'll be like the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, violence filled the earth. I would promote violence because I want this to come true if it weren't God's word. In the days of Noah, I mean, in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, where homosexuality and selfishness prevailed, I would promote that. Why? Because I don't trust this book. I would do this. But here's the thing that's dynamic about this book. And that's just two things. I mean, there's so much more. Did you know that the people that are fulfilling the prophecies of this book don't even have any idea of what's in it? Are you getting this? As a matter of fact, there's... Oops. 
They're so frustrated with the church because as a Christian, I cannot promote sin. And the Bible calls certain things sin. And now here's the thing that's interesting. The sinners are fulfilling prophecy before our eyes, and they don't even know. There was a census that was taken by a Gentile who didn't know the Scriptures. King Herod didn't even know the Scriptures. He had to inquire from the Pharisees, Hey, I heard about something about this Messiah. Where is he supposed to be born? Bethlehem. Interesting, the timing. Because I don't think they were in Bethlehem very long, and she gave birth to Jesus. So could you imagine? Next week I'm going to actually have my daughter come up for a picture. My daughter, as you know, is pregnant. She's near the end of her pregnancy, so she's all there. And I got her permission. She's going to come. So you can see what it may have been like for Mary to make the travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem, and she had no choice. I want you to just let this settle in your heart for a minute. Mary and Joseph didn't have a choice. They had to go to Bethlehem. They were content in Nazareth. And who moves a pregnant woman on a donkey when she's just about ready to deliver a baby? Who? Unless they have no choice. Because remember last week we talked about the oppressive nature of the Romans. We talked about the oppression that was taking place in the Jews at the time. And so for Joseph to say, wait a minute, I don't like that rule. I don't like that. Don't you see my wife is pregnant? We're not going to Bethlehem. I can't move this woman because she's too pregnant. I, want, I care for her safety. He said, okay. Off he went. I find that fascinating. And see, now Mary knew who she was carrying because it had been told her by the angel. Joseph even knew who she was carrying because he was going to put her away meaning kill her because of righteousness, because she was pregnant and not married. Back then, believe it or not, back then, they killed uh, those that committed adultery or fornication, premarital sex, and they got pregnant. It was not a good thing. But think about this for just a moment. God interrupted his dream one night, and he spared Mary having been put away. And so think about this, though. And he loved her. And he took her from Nazareth to Bethlehem, and it wasn't even his choice. See, a lot of times, sometimes, I heard something from a prophet, and I won't tell you who it is, but he made this declaration on, on video, and I wish I had his telephone number because him and I would have had a conversation because he's so off. He said, you know, he says, I prophesy this and I prophesy that. And he said, and the reason these prophets may, prophecies may not come is because there's not enough faith in the church. Wrong. If you ever hear a prophet say that a prophecy that he declared doesn't come true because of the lack of faith in the church, he's a false prophet. God doesn't need you. God doesn't need me. He can use a Gentile that knows nothing about his prophecies to do and accomplish his will. Amen? He don't need us. So if you've got a prophet that makes that kind of a declaration, shut him off. Never turn him back on. Don't ever listen to him again because he's false. And he doesn't want to take the responsibility to repent and ask forgiveness. And if he doesn't, he's headed for some bad. You say, why are you so passionate about this? Because it's a real concern for me that my people, my church, could get influenced by somebody like this. I don't think you would, but could. And I want to warn you, stay away from weirdos. Say, well, Pastor, you're a weirdo. Not my kind of weirdo. Their kind of weirdo. <laughs> Micah 5.2 reveals three prophecies about Jesus. The first place, or the first is the place of his birth in Bethlehem. And it also talks about his lineage. He comes from the clan of Judah or Judea. So here's an interesting thing, too. Family tree. And I'm going to read this. We're going to go right through all the names. I'm going to mess them up. You can laugh if you want, but we're just, uh, and if you think it's too funny, I'll have you come up here and read all these names. But we're going to go through the names, and then I'm going to talk about a few to talk about even our sinful behavior cannot stop prophetic to take place. Amen? 
When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, the son of Matthath, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jani, the son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Hesli, the son of Nagai, the son of Maat, the son of Matthias, the son of Simon, the son of Joshish, the son of Joda, the son of Jonan, the son of Risa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kozim, the son of Elamon, yeah, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eleazar, the son of Joram, the son of Matath, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonah, the son of Eliakim, the son of Mila, the son of Mina, the son of Matthiah, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nashon, the son of Aminadab, the son of Admin, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of David, the son of Sarek, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Heber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Oh, that's sons. Now, while Luke records the lineage of Mary, Matthew records the lineage of Joseph. Now, Joseph obviously had nothing to do with Mary becoming pregnant with the Son of God. But, interesting to note that both came from the lineage of Judah. One was Solomon, which was Joseph, and one was Nathan, another one of Bathsheba's sons, and that was Mary. And I have an interesting thought about that. I almost wonder if Jesus came through the lineage of Nathan, or Nathan's lineage, as opposed to Solomon's lineage, because Solomon soiled his lineage. Not that the others didn't, and not that there wasn't soil in the lineage. It's just a thought. Those of you that are theologians out there, don't bash me. It's just a thought. While Luke records the lineage of Mary, Matthew records the lineage of Joseph, which he, also, uh, which he is also from the lineage of Judah. According to Matthew Henry's commentary concerning Luke, he writes, but Luke designed to show that Christ was the seed of the woman that should break the serpent's head, traces his pedigree upwards as high as Adam, and begins with Eli, or Heli, who was the father not of Joseph, but of the Virgin Mary. Um, and then just some information on there. But let's, let's just back up a little bit on the lineage here. Uh, yeah, so here's the thing that's interesting. You see about halfway down where it says Judah, the son of Judah? You know what's interesting about the son of Judah? The son of Judah, which was Perez, was actually his daughter-in-law's child through him. In other words, him and his daughter-in-law had a child together. Can't stop the prophecy of God. I could go on and on. Here's the thing that's interesting. Did you know that the king lineage, lineage from David was through a woman that he had had an adultery, adulterous affair with, killed her husband, and then married her when her husband was dead and mourning had gone. She had her son Solomon. She had three other sons. One of them was Nathan. And two boys, lineage of Christ, king, went through them. What does that mean? That means this. That when God's got a plan, even human stuff can't wreck his plan. Amen? Fulfillment of prophecy. So Micah 5.2 doesn't just reveal the place of his birth or his lineage, but he also talks about his preexistence. Right? Now here's the interesting thing. His preexistence is talked a lot about in John's Gospel. And those of us that have been meeting on Wednesday nights, this is familiar to us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So in other words, when Jesus hit the scene, He didn't start like you and I, where He hadn't existed before. Because when you and I started, we hadn't existed before, but he did. As a matter of fact, <laughs> if you continue down uh, in John, uh, it talks about how he created all things. Now, here's something that will wreck your mind. But if you're God, it won't. But we're not God, so it will. Can you imagine? The Bible says that everything that was created, and I mean everything, 
Every single thing that was created was created by Jesus. That's very clear. Matter of fact, if you don't believe me, go home, read John 1, the whole chapter. But here's the cool thing. If he indeed created everything, think about this. He was creating himself in his mother's womb. Some of you are like, you just lost me. That's because we're not God. The Bible's clear. The pre-existent one spoke all things into, into being. The Bible's very clear in John. Everything that was created was created by him. So when you're God, to create yourself in your mother's womb, even the woman that you created. So see, he created his mother, and then he created himself in his mother's womb. We just don't know the God we serve, do we? But we're learning. He's amazing. John 17, right out of Jesus' mouth, verses 22 to 24. The glory which you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Now let's get to the real cool thing. Because, you know, skeptics could say, well, you know, it just happened that she had to deliver the baby in Bethlehem. Okay, she fulfilled a prophecy, all right? It just happened, so happened, that he had to come through the line of Judah. Well, that's easy because there was only 12 tribes, and so eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch one, right? Come on now, skeptics come up with some pretty interesting uh, discussions and then of course you know could have had the argument about his pre-existence and, and whatever but here's one of the things that is one of the most spectacular prophetic events that has ever been prophesied about jesus not only that it was a virgin birth but that it was a boy isaiah 7 verses 10 on then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. I want you to think a minute. A virgin. A son. A sign. Prophetic. Out of all the Old Testament prophets, there is more written about Jesus' first and second coming than any other prophets. As a matter of fact, if I understand uh, historians correctly, I believe that Jesus quoted out of the book of Isaiah more than any other prophets uh, out of the Old Testament. Made a lot of, quoted a lot of uh, his writings. Is there a New Testament support for this prophecy? Yes. We'll look at those in two Gospels, both Matthew and Luke. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, and, and going on a little further, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, uh, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and she shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. There's a mouthful right here, and I'll tell you why. There are some religious beliefs that believe that Mary died a virgin. 
Nope. She had other children. For some reason, they ignore that. But look what he says. But he kept her a virgin until she gave birth. To those of us that understand the dynamics of how a baby gets in the womb, develops, and delivers, that should cause us to be like, that doesn't make any sense. Talk about a profound miracle, a virgin giving birth. And it said that he kept her a virgin. He didn't touch her until after she had Jesus. Pretty powerful stuff. So now let's look at Luke's account. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 and on a little ways. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man. Let me stop here for a minute. Notice she's in where? Nazareth. That's where she lived, right? To a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Now I'm going to stop here for a minute because I want you to pay very close attention to her response. Listen very carefully. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to him, uh, to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth, who has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who is called barren is now in her sixth month. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son. I don't know why I wrote this twice. Oh, uh, her son in her old age, I didn't. And she who called, uh, was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond sleep of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So my question is this. Mary, a Jewish girl, raised in a Jewish home. Why didn't she know the prophecy about Isaiah? Because she declared to the angel, how can this be because I'm a virgin? Did you ever ask that question? Isn't that a great question? Let's consider the sign of the times, or the times. Generally, in that culture, very few women were educated. The only time they were taught anything about Scripture is when they went to synagogue or whatever was taught within the home. But they were not educated. They weren't able to read, most of them. And if you continue to study about Joseph and Mary, they were very poor. As a matter of fact, you can tell how poor they are by the sacrifice they gave when Jesus was born. They gave two turtle doves. Turtle doves were a sign as, you're broke, you have no money, this is all you can afford, but God says it's okay. So chances are she had no education. Now here's the thing that I find absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. The Lord comes to her and says, hail favored one. And she doesn't even know. See, you don't have the, whole, have the whole Bible memorized to be a favored one in God's eyes. There was righteousness with her. She didn't even know. She says, how can this be because I'm a virgin? How can this be because I'm a virgin? And notice we read a little earlier, because this has been out there too, and I know I'm saying this in church, and you probably don't hear this in church very often, but there's some that claim that somehow God had sex with Mary to have the child. Because we just read that Joseph kept her a virgin until she had the baby. She was still a virgin, untouched. What God did, God did supernaturally. And God went to a young woman who didn't even know. And I love what she says. Be it according to your word. 
because I'm your bond servant. Think of the implication. Because if you have any idea of what law and life was like back in that day to be Jewish, do you remember when they caught the woman in adultery and they brought her to Jesus? What are we going to do? Jesus said, he who has no sin cast the first stone. Did you know that in that day, if you were engaged, engaged, not necessarily married, but engaged, you were considered married. That if, let's say, I was engaged to my wife, and some guy came along and violated to my wife, and we're just engaged, we're not even married, it's the same as adultery. Both die. So the Old Testament teaches. That's what they practice. Why do you think the Bible says that Joseph was thinking about putting her away? I'm a righteous man. I'm not going to be with a woman who just committed adultery. Because you can't hide pregnancy. Amen. Hallelujah. True? Think of the implications. See, a lot of times as modern day westernized Christians, we think if it's comfortable, Jesus, amen, hallelujah, I'm all in. Thank you for considering me for this. But man, when it's uncomfortable, when you could be accused of adultery, when you could be accused of sin, are you going to say yes? She did. And I love how the angel continues on and talks about how Elizabeth supernaturally got pregnant in her old age. And then I love what he says, for nothing will be impossible with God. I love her response. Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I could preach two messages just on this particular portion of Scripture all by itself. She had guts. She was willing to say yes, recognizing. Apparently, she didn't talk to Joseph too much about this whole experience because Joseph happened to notice that, hey, honey, you're gaining a little weight there. So it wasn't something that she just went out and told, hey, mom and dad, I just met with an angel. I'm going to be pregnant soon. No, I didn't have sex. Put yourself in that place. Think about it. Think of the culture. Think of the way it was back then. I'll bet you that when the angel left, she didn't say a word. When she got to Elizabeth, if you'll notice, as you continue to read, Elizabeth's response, and I love some of the Facebook things that are coming out where it says, uh, you know, obviously it's against abortion. It says, hey, listen, a baby in the womb was the first one to recognize Jesus in the womb, you know. And so here's the thing. She walks into Elizabeth's home, doesn't say a word. At least the Scripture doesn't teach that. And, <coughs> and Elizabeth says, she makes a declaration about being the mother of her Lord. And she said, when you came in, he leapt in my womb. My baby. She said yes to Jesus. Or to God. To the angel. When the implications of saying yes could have cost her her life. Again, the high priest brings the adulterous woman caught in adultery. They didn't bring the guy, but they brought her. This woman was caught into adultery. You know what the law says. Jesus says, you know what? Hey, if you don't have any sin, go ahead and toss the first stone. I'm waiting. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say, I'm waiting. But everybody took off and left. Why? She knew what the fate was. She knew that she was to be killed. And I don't know about you, you don't have to do much convincing when the lady's got a belly to say that she has committed adultery. The implications could have cost her her life. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Her saying, Yes, Lord, changed everything. It even changed the calendar. 
because the earth is a whole lot older than 2,020 years. It changed everything. This little girl, this innocent girl, who was a virgin, by saying yes to the Lord with the consequence of a possibility of being killed, changed everything. It changed your life. It changed my life. Those of us that are Christians, it changed, multiplied millions, and maybe even billions of lives throughout the centuries because she said, here am I, your bond servant. May it be done to me according to your will. Wow. Somebody else said something like that. Of course, he didn't get pregnant. Billy Graham. I don't know how he said what he said, but he said sometime in his life, Lord, have your way in my life. Do what you will in my life. And multiplied millions heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And maybe multiplied millions accepted him as their Lord and Savior. And you go all the way back to this point right here, this little tiny girl who said yes to Jesus. It rocked and changed the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, you Western Christians. Come on. Hallelujah. Now let me ask you this. How many of us are willing to say, God, I am your bondservant. May it be done according to your will in me, whatever the cost. Because you know what, folks? You never know when you say yes to Jesus what that's going to be like future generations ahead. You never know what kind of dynamic change you're going to make in the course of someone's history. I love the fact that we're living in calendar 2020. Why? Because Jesus changed the course of history. Anytime Jesus is involved in somebody's life who says yes, that changes the course of their history. When Jesus came into my life, he changed the course of my history. I was a sinner, set for hell, man. And Jesus came into my life, and he changed the course of history. And it had nothing to do with what I did, except, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I am wicked. I need you to come. I need you to forgive me of my sins and change me and live through me and be my Lord. Come on now. And I don't know how many people I've led to Christ. It hasn't been Billy Graham. I I can tell you that right now. I don't know how many people I've discipled, but I know this. I'm just a nobody. I'm just a somebody that Jesus said, I love you, and if you'll follow me, I'm going to use you. What about you? What about you by television, electronics? Have you said yes to Jesus? If that little girl could say yes to Jesus and show signs of things that people wouldn't have understood and yet would have wanted to kill her, she said yes anyway, even though it could have cost her her life. We've only briefly looked at four prophecies. If I were to take you through every prophecy Jesus fulfilled, I believe there are 365 prophecies that Jesus already fulfilled. It would be one prophecy a day for an entire year, or it would be one prophecy a week, and somebody would have to take my place because I would be dead by the time they got done. We've only looked at four concerning the birth of Jesus. My question to us, by you electronically, are you convinced that he's the Messiah? Is Jesus your personal Messiah? You know, because we can, can, we can be convinced that Jesus was a good guy. We can be convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. But if he's not my personal Messiah, then I'm missing the gift. You know, I can look under a tree and acknowledge gifts. I'm going to stay close. I, look, I can look under the tree and acknowledge that there's a gift. I can even see a gift with my name on it. But if all I do is stare at the thing and know, yep, there's a gift there. Yep, it's got my name on it and never touch it. I can never enjoy the benefits and the blessing of what that gift has and holds. So let me tell you, if you're out there and you believe, yeah, Jesus is Messiah, but he's not your Messiah, you have not opened the gift that God has prepared for you. And I'm asking you this morning, consider opening the gift, receiving the gift, taking the gift upon yourself. Here's how you do it. It's just simple as this. Lord Jesus, I have tried to lead my life, and I've made a train wreck out of the whole thing. I've broken your laws. I'm a sinner. And I need you, Jesus, to come into my life and to be Lord of it. You need to start taking the wheel and driving this train that I've wrecked. 
You need to be my Lord. And I'm asking you, would you please forgive me of my sin? Thank you, Lord Jesus. You had died for me on the cross. And I just love the fact that you, above every person on the planet, you're the only one that rose from the dead on your own power. Three days later, I can trust you. I can trust you. And I'm asking you right now, come into my heart, come into my life. Be my God. Be my Savior. Let me, let me receive the gift that you have done and given to me even 2,000 years ago, still just as fresh today. If you've invited Jesus to be your Lord and Savior this morning, look us up on our website, crosspointchurchag.org, I believe, or go on YouTube and put Kevin Horian and our stuff will come up. And I would love to hear from you. I would love to know if you gave your heart to Jesus this morning. You would make my Christmas the best Christmas, and I don't even have to be related to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.